I will always support Israel's security. I will bring with me an unshakable commitment to Israel's security. An unshakable commitment to Israel's security. In 2008, Senator Barack Obama ran for president as a pro-Israel candidate. Now let me be clear. Israel's security is sacrosanct. Is sacrosanct. It's non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. He placed himself in the mainstream of American opinion on Israel and the Middle East. With secure, recognized, defensible borders. And Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel and it must remain undivided. Three years later, Obama is defending his record on Israel. America does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. I thought that uh, he came down pretty hard on Israel. He didn't have a full grasp of what the region really looks like. This president has done more to delegitimize and undermine Israel's position in the world than any other president. President Obama claims his administration has done more for Israel's security than any other. He says his critics are distorting his record for partisan gain. The way that this was presented to the Israelis is you have to do the following and the Palestinians have to do nothing in return. This is not the way you treat an ally. As Israel faces growing threats in the region, the Iranian nuclear program, an uprising in Syria, the rise of Islamic extremists in Turkey and Egypt, the terrorist groups Hamas and Hezbollah building larger stockpiles of missiles, the friendship of the U.S. president has never been more important. What has President Obama's record on Israel really been? The Obama administration was, from the very beginning, under the spell of some very conventional views that first the Bush administration had poisoned the well, had poisoned relations between the United States and the larger Muslim world, and second, the key to all the problems, all the many problems that afflicted the Middle East was the dispute between Israel and the Palestinians. If you could solve that, all the other problems would fall into place. Obama began his presidency with a campaign of outreach to Muslims. He granted his first television interview as president to Al Arabiya, an Arabic language news channel. At a global summit, he greeted the Saudi king with a deep bow. He traveled to Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, but each time skipped Israel. Now what I'd like to do is take some questions. I want to make sure that we end before uh, the call to prayers. In Saudi Arabia, Obama accepted an award from King Abdullah. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The next day, he delivered a landmark speech to the Muslim world in Cairo, fulfilling a campaign promise to speak from a Muslim capital in the first hundred days of his presidency. Assalamu alaikum. I feared in advance the speech would be a terrible mistake, but it was worse than my worst fear. The United States does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. It is time for these settlements to stop. There was an attempt here to put some distance between the United States and Israel. I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing the response that you saw in that auditorium. I think it's very dangerous. That the aspiration for a Jewish homeland is rooted in a tragic history that cannot be denied. On the other hand, it is also undeniable that the Palestinian people, Muslims and Christians, has suffered for him to stand up there and say that the Holocaust was a moral equivalent to the way the Israelis are treating Palestine right now. It's just an outrageous comparison. He did more in three minutes to delegitimize the existence of Israel than any president in American history. Thank you. For uh, Israeli officials and for the citizens of the state of Israel, I think they were quite concerned that his narrative of Israel seemed to fit the sort of the resentful and rejectionist narrative of lots of Middle Eastern actors, that the only reason for the state of Israel was because of the Holocaust. I think it showed right there he didn't quite have a full grasp of what the region really looks like. In that speech, he suggested 
addressing all Muslims of the world, that all Muslims of the world have a special interest where Israelis build apartments. Obama also launched a new approach to Israel. It began by demanding that Israel make unprecedented concessions to the Palestinians and questioning Israel's desire for peace. There was this phone call he had with a group of American Jewish leaders, uh, and he said that it was a problem that there was no daylight between the United States and Israel. And he said that this didn't advance the peace process. What we needed to do was show daylight between the U.S. and Israel, and the United States needed to push Israel. Obama lectured Jewish leaders that Israelis must engage in serious self-reflection about their commitment to peace. The Obama administration demanded from Israel what it called a settlement freeze, a complete cessation of any building by Jews on land claimed by the Palestinians. We have to make progress on settlements. The settlements have to be stopped. He wants to see a stop to settlements, not uh, some settlements, not uh, outposts, not natural growth exceptions, uh, and we intend to press that point. The idea is that the settlements are central to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And the Palestinian-Israeli issue is somehow central to the Middle East. I mean, I think that even when this president came to office, most Americans realized this was nonsensical. The demand was made sternly and publicly. America does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlement. Stopping settlement activity. It ends the occupation that began in 1967. That is our position. That is what we have communicated very clearly. Yet no demand was made of the Palestinians. President Obama could have asked many things of the Palestinians that he refrained from asking of them. He could have asked them to undertake reforms of their educational system. The educational system still systematically teaches hatred of Jews and teaches the illegitimacy of the state of Israel in any borders. The president did none of the above, and I think only served to embolden the Palestinians, who now believe that they had an ally on their side uh, who was willing to push the Israelis to make concessions up front. The Palestinians understood that they had a free hand. At a political convention, Palestinian leaders celebrated terrorism. Obama had no comment. The settlement freeze became a U.S. and Palestinian precondition for Israel to meet. We have been told by many of our friends that once Israel takes the first meaningful step towards peace, the Palestinians and the Arab world would respond in a positive, virtuous cycle for peace. The way that this was presented to the Israelis is you have to do the following and the Palestinians have to do nothing in return. Well, the government of Israel has taken a very big step towards peace today. Authorized the policy of restraint regarding settlements, which will include a suspension of new permits and new construction in Judea and Samaria for a period of 10 months. And I hope that the Palestinians in the Arab world will seize this opportunity to work with us to forge a new beginning and a new future for our peoples, for our children and for theirs. Yet instead of encouraging the Palestinians to talk, Obama's focus on Israel only encouraged their silence, hoping that Obama would continue pressuring Israel. By making a huge issue about all Israeli building, the president established a new demand And he forced the Palestinians to adopt this as their own demand, because what Palestinian leader could be seen to be less robust, less demanding on behalf of Palestinian interests than the President of the United States. The first leg of a week-long Middle East tour, Vice President Joe Biden is the highest ranking... During the settlement freeze, in March 2010, Vice President Joe Biden traveled to Israel. During his visit, A municipal planning committee announced approval for a phase of a construction plan for a neighborhood in Jerusalem called Ramat Shlomo. Ramat Shlomo is not East Jerusalem, and it's not considered a settlement. It's an area uh, of Israel that is over the 1967 lines, but certainly is not an area that the Palestinians have traditionally claimed to be their own. It is very much part of the fabric of Israel. Uh, It's in North Jerusalem. The settlement freeze did not apply to Jerusalem, 
But the Obama administration decided to use the announcement to launch an unprecedented campaign of condemnation. The announcement of the settlements uh, the very day that the vice president was there was insulting. It was insulting, but it was an insult to the United States. This was uh, an, uh, an affront. It was an insult. Not the right way uh, to behave. That was expressed uh, by the secretary of state as well as the vice president. More now on that White House meeting late yesterday between President Obama and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It was the harshest period of condemnation in the history of U.S.-Israel relations. What happened there was an affront, it was an insult, very, uh, very destructive. This announcement was not a violation of the freeze. The Obama administration was really very aggressively seizing an opportunity to show the Palestinians and to show the larger world, the larger Arab world, that it could be very tough, could be ferociously tough on the Israelis. The Obama administration was unrelenting. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton berated Netanyahu on a 45-minute phone call. The United States considered the announcement a deeply negative signal about Israel's approach to the bilateral relationship and counter to the spirit of the vice president's trip and to reinforce that this action had undermined trust and confidence. And she made clear that the Israeli government needed to demonstrate not just through words, but through specific actions, that they are committed to this relationship. There's this public shaming. There's this beating the, uh, you know, beating the dog in public to show everyone else that you have control over the dog. Well, this is, this is, this is a, a very bad idea. When the White House calls out Israel and starts beating on it in public, I think that people are astonished. Our regional allies are quite surprised by this and they don't understand this behavior. This is not the way you treat an ally. The Palestinians now have not even accepted, the, before the Biden incident, did not even accept uh, direct negotiations with Israel. That's why we're having proximity talks. They have not made a gesture or concession of a step. And the Secretary of State says Israel has to show its seriousness about peace. Now that is an insult. Israel has been looking for a peace agreement since the last 62 years. Something else happened during the settlement freeze. Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, held a celebration to honor a terrorist who murdered 37 Israelis. The Obama administration said nothing. No protest was lodged. No criticism was made. The message was clear. Obama would let the Palestinians get away with almost anything. Netanyahu came to Washington with the hope of putting the controversy to rest. Obama was not in a conciliatory mood. When Netanyahu and his advisors arrived at the White House, they were shown in through a side door. There was no traditional photo op or joint press statement. Despite the meeting lasting through dinner, Obama declined to eat with the Israelis. They were served non-kosher food, which some of them could not eat, and they were later sent out through a side door. I believe uh, that the uh, president uh, is embarked upon changing the uh, foreign policy of the United States uh, by dissing, as you use the expression, uh, the state of Israel as he did at the White House. Congress was increasingly alarmed. 76 senators, half of them Democrats, sending Secretary of State Hillary Clinton a letter urging her to end what they see as the administration's a very negative stance toward Israel. Obama continued his attacks. An administration official leaked to the press that Obama might impose a peace plan on Israel. He hosted a summit in Washington that Netanyahu was supposed to attend. When Egypt and Turkey revealed that they would condemn Israel there, Obama said nothing, forcing Netanyahu to cancel. Does the Prime Minister of Israel feels he cannot come to a nuclear security summit because he'd be humiliated again by the American president is really a sad, sad state of affairs. Shortly after, Obama hosted Mahmoud Abbas at the White House, who continued his refusal to negotiate. Obama used the meeting to announce a $70 million increase in U.S. aid to the Palestinians. Israel had not been so diplomatically and politically isolated in decades. 
an entire flotilla of nine vessels, the lion's share from Turkey, has been mustered from around the world. I think that some of the policies that the Obama administration had embraced seemed to signal to Turkey that it was okay to challenge Israel. What the Turks learned from the administration's public flogging of the Netanyahu government is that this is okay for the Turks to do it as well. In May, Turkey put the White House's relationship with Israel to the test. A flotilla of six Turkish ships sailed toward the Gaza Strip in an attempt to break Israel's arms blockade of Hamas. One of the ships contained members of a terrorist organization supported by the Turkish government. They had plotted an ambush. <laughs> As the Israeli soldiers descended onto the deck of the Mavi Mamara, they were beaten, stabbed, thrown over railings, and dragged below decks. We made repeated offers that they should bring the boats to the port of Ashdod, and from there we guaranteed that all humanitarian cargo would be transferred to the people of Gaza. Unfortunately, this group decided on confrontation. They decided on violence. Their lives threatened. The Israelis killed nine of the attackers. Condemnation of Israel was instantaneous, led by the Islamist Turkish prime minister. Before the facts were known, the international community blamed Israel. There is an unambiguous need for Israel to act with restraint and in line with its international obligations. The use of force was not only inappropriate, but also disproportionate. Turkey introduced a UN resolution condemning Israel and demanding an investigation. Obama refused to veto it, and he said nothing as European and Arab leaders denounced Israel. If I had been there and, and had my discretion, I'd have said, I'm not going to negotiate this. It is fundamentally unacceptable. You don't condemn something and then call for an investigation. In the days after the incident, the facts came out. The attack was carefully planned in advance. The soldiers acted in self-defense. But Obama would not defend Israel. Turkish leaders demanded that Israel apologize for killing the terrorists and end the blockade on Hamas. They escalated their threats against Israel. Obama pressured Israel to apologize. He never called on Turkey to stop its threats. Obama calls the Turkish prime minister one of his five closest friends among world leaders and his closest friend in the Middle East. It was amazing to watch the timid approach of this administration in, in the wake of this crisis. Uh, you know, if, if in fact the relationship between Erdogan and Obama is as close as it is, why was it that the president of the United States, uh, the president of the most powerful country in the world, could not bring the Turkish leader to heel? Why was it that he could not rein him in and prevent him from uh, engaging in some very dangerous activities? The Obama administration continued blaming Israel, only encouraging Turkey's attacks. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta is warning Israel is becoming increasingly isolated in the Middle East, and he says Israeli leaders must restart negotiations with Palestinians and work to restore good relations with Egypt and Turkey. Robert Gates lashed out at Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, calling him an ungrateful ally, and said he was responsible for diplomatically isolating Israel and harming American interests. The administration has sought to put the onus on Jerusalem here, rather than trying to rein in Ankara and trying to rein in Cairo and trying to discipline them, which is very, very important and will become more important in the coming years as well as Islamists are more influential in the region. Each time Obama has rebuked Israel, Turkey has repeated the charges. Like Turkey, the Palestinians also decided to pursue a new path. Hostile to Israel and certain of little opposition from President Obama. At the UN, they pushed a resolution declaring Israeli settlements illegal in opposition to long-standing US policy. Yet Obama refused to say whether he would veto it. His silence encouraged the Palestinians. 
despite President Obama's lengthy phone call with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, urging that the resolution be pulled, Abbas turned Mr. Obama down. Obama's UN ambassador vetoed the resolution, but then delivered an anti-Israel tirade at the Security Council. We reject in the strongest terms the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlement activity, corroded hopes for peace and stability in the region, devastates trust between the parties, and threatens the prospects for peace. Congress was astonished. You repeatedly refused to publicly commit in advance to veto that resolution, leaving Israel essentially twisting in the wind. Many of us read this as we agree with the demonizing, condemnation, and vilifying, but we regrettably have to vote against it. We threw our friend and ally, Israel, to the wolves. The lessons seem to be clear. Obama may oppose the Palestinians, but he would do so quietly and timidly. But Israel would be treated once again to public flogging. Two weeks later, Obama again questioned Israel's commitment to peace this time to Jewish community leaders visiting the White House. In the spring of 2011, President Obama delivered a major speech on the uprisings taking place in Arab countries. He used it to announce a surprising policy change on Israel, hours before Prime Minister Netanyahu boarded a flight to the United States. We believe the borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps. When Israelis hear a return to 67 lines with land swaps, what the Israelis hear is acceptance of the Palestinian beginning for negotiations, not a recognition of Israeli concerns that you begin with the question of defensible borders. So this was a kind of a slap in the face or throwing down of a gauntlet the Palestinians had long claimed that all the territory on the eastern side of the 1967 borders was theirs, and the president seemed to legitimize these claims. Now, it's important to remember that these lines were never borders. They were never political borders. They were armistice lines after the 1948-1949 war, and that happened to be where the guns fell silent. And what the president was saying is, is that this was no longer something that needed to be negotiated, that this was being imposed by the president of the United States. Netanyahu's visit to Washington was instantly transformed into a confrontation. I was in Europe yesterday when the speech was made and the reaction in Europe was finally an American president spanking Israel, finally an American president saying Israel is the, is the problem, is the obstacle to peace. And when the Israelis feel that from the, Euro the European community, when they feel that from the Arab world, that interpretation, believe me, it's not an inducement to peace. And for the president to pick this fight in this particular circumstance seems to me not, not a worthy thing to do. Leading Democrats repudiated Obama. Everyone knows that the 1967 lines are simply indefensible for Israel. And for the president to emphasize that, I think, was a, was a very a big mistake. No one should set premature parameters about borders. Israel's borders must be defensible. Jerusalem is the undivided and eternal capital of Israel. At the heart of the disagreement is Israel's right to defensible borders. Retreating to the pre-1967 lines would remove Israel's presence on the border between Jordan and the West Bank, allowing arms to flow into the mountains of the West Bank that overlook Israel's major cities. This is not a strategic depth. This is actually a unstrategic depth, which gives a huge temptation to the other side to attack you and cut the country into two pieces. And in that area between the 67 line and the Mediterranean seashore, uh, there is 80% of the Israeli production. There is 70% um, of the Israeli population. The 67 line, it's a big temptation to attack you. We have to fight terrorism effectively. And the 67 line is actually a, a motor range uh, from uh, all the Israeli main uh, cities. As Obama piled demands on Israel, he said next to nothing as Abbas sought to unify the Palestinian government with the terrorist group Hamas, 
and have Palestine declared a state by the UN without making peace with Israel. The idea behind it was the Palestinians would cease to uh, negotiate with the Israelis, go directly to the United Nations and declare a state. And what they began to realize is that if they had the United States on their side, not forcing them to negotiate, not forcing them to make any concessions, it was easier for them to go to the UN in this capacity. The uh, support that Palestine has in the General Assembly is overwhelming, and uh, that really goes to the mistakes the Obama administration has made. What type of way is this to negotiate? Put a gun to Israel's head, and every time the Palestinians don't like the way the negotiations are going, the uh, Palestinians can threaten that they're going back to the United Nations. You get the sense that they believed that they were dealing with the most pro-Palestinian in history, perhaps since Jimmy Carter, perhaps ever. It intensifies its... In front of the UN General Assembly, Abbas delivered a fiery anti-Israel speech, denying that Jews have any historic connection to Israel. And he delivered his speech on Palestine Liberation Organization letterhead, showing a map of Palestine with Israel erased. The Obama administration, as usual, offered no criticism. While the Obama administration was applying a great deal of pressure on Israel, the Palestinian Authority under Mahmoud Abbas was in direct negotiation with the Hamas terrorist organization the entire time, trying to work out a unity deal. And the United States was silent. The United States clearly was opposed to Hamas participation, but uh, was very careful not to challenge this notion of a unity government. Israel was not so quiet in opposing Hamas. But Israel will not negotiate with a Palestinian government backed by the Palestinian version of Al-Qaeda. That we will not do. So I say to President Abbas, tear up your pact with Hamas. Sit down and negotiate. Make peace with the Jewish state. If you go to Palestinian schools, Israel is not mentioned there, talking only about their issue. The Shahid, the suicide bombers are actually the big heroes of those uh, kids. When we talk about peace, we need to see what is behind it. It's, it's not just a political arrangement and some security arrangements. We need to see the people, and in this process, the people were left behind. So terrorism uh, prevailed, and I don't see the educational and cultural approach to this peace. If you talk about peace, do what we do. We talk about peace, we talk about democracy, we teach the children that these are the basic uh, issues. It's a cultural, educational process, and we are very uh, far from it. Barack Obama and Nicolas Sarkozy are now being quoted from a conversation they had about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The exchange was overheard at the G20 summit. Sarkozy reportedly said of Netanyahu, quote, I can't stand him anymore. He's a liar. President Obama then responded, you may be sick of him, but me, I have to deal with him every day. Barack Obama has lectured Israel more than her enemies. He has pressured Israel to apologize to her attackers. I think he's handled the relationship with Israel in a way that has encouraged Israel's enemies. He singles out Israel for condemnation over and over again, but says in speeches that Israel has no better friend. He blames Israel for the lack of peace talks, but not the Palestinians, who have refused to come to the table for years. He says his commitments to Israel's security is unshakable. But he pressures Israel not to take military action against Iran. The President of the United States has rightly or wrongly portrayed a weak America and created a perception of a weak American president. The words of Barack Obama the campaigner were reassuring to friends of Israel. The actions of Barack Obama the president have been alarming and damaging to a relationship of trust between our two democracies. Barack Obama promised to be an unwavering friend and defender of Israel. It is deeply unfortunate and dangerous. 
that he has failed to keep this promise. I urge Jews all over the country to vote for him, saying that he would be just as good as John McCain on the security of uh, Israel. I don't think it's true anymore. It's an entirely natural human response. You reward your friends and you punish your enemies. The more and more we move away from that in the Middle East, the bigger a problem this will be for American foreign policy and, of course, for the state of Israel.